Hi, this is James Rousseau, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of The Coiling Solution, where we look to empower you through awareness and actionable insights. On this episode, I am linking up with Hall of Fame quarterback Fran Tarkenton. Not only did Fran play 18 seasons in the NFL and was the first scrambler as we know it, but he went on to have a successful career as a sports broadcaster, co-host of the TV show That's Incredible, and become a successful business owner, in fact, owning several businesses. During our conversation, Fran takes us on a wonderful journey through his career. You'll gain some key insights, such as, why is an NFL quarterback working other jobs in the offseason, and, and wait a minute, even during the regular season as well? Why did Fran do sports commentating and co-host a TV show that's incredible? And how do you leverage current things such as being an NFL player to do bigger things in the future? So sit back, buckle up, because we're about to link up with Fran Tarkenton. Well, I am pleased to be here with the great, the one and only Fran Tarkenton. For those who don't know Fran Tarkenton, and I don't know how that could be, maybe you're just too young, Fran is a Hall of Fame quarterback. Uh, 1986 NFL Hall of Fame, 1987 College Hall of Fame, 18 seasons in the NFL, 13 with Minnesota Vikings, five with the New York Giants. If you get a chance, I would advise you to go back and look at some clips. I've known Fran now for about six, seven years. At least. And uh, I never realized, Fran, how much scrambling and running you did. I, I didn't know that. Until you know, I it's an interesting film. thing. I was the first, quote, quote, scrambler in football in 1961. And I came into the league, and all the quarterbacks were pocket quarterbacks. It was almost uh, against the rules for a quarterback to run or get out of the pocket because the guys didn't want to chase them. And they weren't the same condition athletes of today. And so uh, the way the the, the players did back then, we'd have a little practice. We'd trot around and then go to the beer hall and have a few beers. That was a workout. I had no idea. Yeah. At this point, I, I, but I looked at the film and stuff, and, and you, I'm going, that, that explains a lot, because you're yeah. so energetic. So. I, w- I was the original scrambler, and I, when I finished, here I am bragging here, but, you know, if you've done it, you don't have to brag, right? right. So anyway, I, I fin- finished my 18 years. I set all the passing records, most right. touchdown passes, most, most uh, yards gained passing, et cetera, et cetera. But I also set the rushing record for quarterback. Is that right? That wasn't a high high bar back then. (laughs) And then Randall Cunningham came along and and broke mine. Now Cam Newton's breaking everybody. But but then there was no mobile quarterbacks, and I was I was quote quote the first mobile quarterback and a scrambler, and I was a disruptor. Right. And I got criticized for it. And they yelled and screamed and said, you'll never make it. You'll never, you can't win with a scrambling quarterback and you cannot, they're going to kill you. I played 18 years. I missed five games because of injury and that's it. And so, but it kind of changed. Roger Staubach came after that. And, and then we had uh, 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 Randall Cunningham came after that. And these guys could really run. And then you go, go get Michael Vick, who, be, who was just dynamic runner and thrower and then you got cam newton a quarterback weighing 260 pounds he doesn't have to run around you he can run over you and he's another dimension then you go to little russell wilson who's my size and russell wilson he can scramble and he can run and he can throw so it just made the position what it should be that's an athlete position and you should be able to be a double threat passer and runner and uh they give me credit for starting that thing out, but uh, I was the only one that. So really you started did that. the trend. I started. The you trend. started the trend. It's the, I that's was. Amazing. I was. They th- they say I was the first one to really become a scrambler, right. and they had never seen anything like, like that. And I was a freak. Right. And of course, if you're a freak and you're the first, you're criticized, and you'll never, never. Ma- I'll tell you one story. There was a great defensive end, Gino Marchetti, mm-hmm. and he's in the Hall of Fame, and he played for the great Baltimore Colts championship teams. And he's still living in Philadelphia. And Gino was a big Italian, best defensive end I'd ever seen. I'm, I'm playing against him my rookie year. We beat the Colts in my rookie year. And after the game, Gino said, ah, Tarkin and kid, they'll kill him. He'll never make it past his first year. He'll kill him. So later on in my career, Sport Magazine gave me the most valuable player award for the entire league. And they said, who would you like to introduce you? I said, Gino Marchetti. And Gino came and introduced me and told the story. Nice. Yeah. 
So I'm gonna give you one free for for you free for you and your agent. Yeah, there should be something a, a t shirt, a jersey, or a sneaker. The Fran, the first scrambler, <laughs> the, the first scrambler. He put. I think it's too late. Steve, too late. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, you know, we used to play Madden. My son would pick the Falcons yeah, because but, he would play with Vic Michael and Vick. run. Yeah. And, you know, I'd, I'd play up, and then he'd yeah. throw the ball over my head. So, And then Fran went on to be a TV personality, yeah, commentator on Monday Night Football, and then co-host on That's Incredible. I used yeah. to watch That's Incredible, yeah. right? Yeah, um, I was co-host with Kathleen Crosby and John Davis in the early 80s. Right. And it was the, one of the first reality shows. Ran How long for did that about, run? Ran for about five years. About five years. Yeah. Then it ran for another 15, 20 years in Europe. Right. And uh, here, I, I made more money mm-hmm. in one year doing That's Incredible than I made in 18 years playing football. Get out of here. Yeah, I did. We made no money in football back then. My first salary is $12,500. And let me give your audience this. In 18 years, I made a total of $1.6 million in 18 years. Of football. In football. This is in before major years. endorsements. Well, right. we had endorsements, yeah, endorsements, but you got you know, a nickel. Okay. But it wasn't like today, but, but they didn't have any money to, to get out. Now, the quarterback, Kirk Cousins, who played for the Washington Redskins. My team. Nice kid. Yep. Wonderful kid. He signed a contract with the Minnesota Vikings for $85 million, guaranteed for three years. Mm-hmm. And I played 18 years for $1.6 million. Wow. It's a whole new world. Right. So what I had to do in my off seasons, I had to work. Mm. Because I didn't make enough money in football. So I worked every off season for 18 years. Now, here's another step. What did you do? Like, what kind of work? How about I was a salesperson for Wilson Truck System, which was based in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And I was living in Minneapolis. And in the winter of January, I'd go to the Dakotas, the South and North Dakotas, bang on the shipping clerk's doors to get them to ship their goods going from the Dakotas to Minneapolis to Chicago and back. Regulated, right? And here's my salary, $600 a month. Weren't you, uh, wasn't football still popular though back then? Yeah, it was You popular. were still a household name. But, was, but, but we didn't get paid any money. Okay. I made $12,500 my first contract. I just want to pause for a second. So- for, for those of us who've been in all kind of different jobs, different levels, uh, different perks, on and so forth, I just want you to understand and think about the humility of what Fran just said. Well. Right? And, and, but here's what, you know how I learned to play quarterback? Mm-hmm. I played. I got in the arena and played from the time I could walk. I knew how to throw. I knew how to handle myself. The only way to learn business, you've got to get in the arena. And so I've worked in business all my life. I was a salesman for years because if you're an entrepreneur, the first thing you got to have, you got to have revenue. And to get revenue, you got to have a customer. And so I've got to be the chief revenue officer. So I learned how to sell. I learned how to work. I learned how to solve problems. I made speeches four nights a week, year round for $25 a speech at every church that would have me. And so I'll give you another stat. By doing the extracurricular activity, I made more money every offseason in business than I made in the season playing football for 18 years. But more than that, when I retired, I had a skill set. I knew how to be a business person. I knew how to go and understand customers and the customer's always right and to build partnerships and relationships. And because people do business with people they trust and like. And I learned that early on. And it's, it's, it's been the key reason that I've had success in business because it's not about me. It's about my customer. It's not about me. It's about my partner. And if I take, make sure my partner's taken care of and they're making money, then I can make money. If I make sure my customer is happy and I give them great products and great services and, and I follow up, and give them great maintenance, and there whenever they need me, that customer is going to be happy and tell other people, and then they'll go and bring me more customers. So you were actively parlaying yes. your brand during the season, during the off season, et cetera. What yes. were your teammates saying and doing? Nothing. And, and what? They didn't work. They didn't work. They didn't work. How, how, do, how did a lot of them survive they during didn't. that time and after that time? They didn't. They didn't. Most of the guys that, that came up in my era mm-hmm. of the 60s and the the 50s were ridiculous. 60s and the 70s uh, are all broke. 
Very few. But but none of them really worked in the LCs. They thought, you know, I'm a, I'm a star. I People are, you know, taking me to play golf. They're buying me dinners. They're buying me lunches. They're so nice to me. They're nice to you while you're a star. But when you retire, there's another star. And what's the and average life of a football player, typically? Three years. Three years. Three, three. Think and, of that. And highly skilled positions can be longer, right? Like well, quarterback. But the whole, the whole thing, yeah. But, kickers. but when you go three years, that's people that, that are barely able to make it. Okay. So, but, but you're, you know, your star quarterbacks, Tom Brady's going to play forever. Right. He's played 18 years. I played 18 years. Peyton Manning played 18, 19 years. But uh, then you look at uh, the, the great uh, wide receiver from here, Georgia Tech, that played at uh, uh, Detroit so many years. Can't think of his name right now. You remember the name? Uh, but anyway, he was a big, uh, uh, great in, and he, uh, Calvin, Calvin Johnson. Okay. Yeah. And, he, mm-hmm. and, he, mm-hmm. and he played until he was 29 and got out. Most skill positions, when I, other than quarterback, 30 is the magic number. Okay that you start losing a step of speed, a step of quickness, and it's hard to keep delivery. You know, I thought Adrian Peterson, with that body and skills that he had, could last forever. But, you know, at about 29 or 30, his skills diminished, and now he's just a fringe player. That's what happens to the skill guys. The defensive guys, now with the physicality of the game, the concussions, all that stuff, hard for many of them to go beyond 30. 30 is kind of a pretty good mark for people, even the linemen today. So what you did theoretically should be the strategy for most players. Yes. Building your brand to parlay your brand and do something like you did going to television. Because then the third thing you did was become a software executive, right? On well, a- I started, I bought a, I took a, well, I'll go back. I delivered papers at a paper route in Washington, D.C. when I was seven years old. And back then you delivered papers seven days a week. And once a month, you go back to the people's houses and you knock on their door and they pay you for the fee. You had to go collect. I'm seven and eight and nine years old in Washington, D.C. doing that. And I didn't know I was learning, but I was. And then I came back and, and moved to Athens, Georgia. And in the off season, I worked on, uh, 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 there, we had great poultry farms all over the Georgia. I worked on a poultry farm every Saturday and Sunday during the year. After the games on Friday night, I'd, pl- I'd go to the poultry farm on Saturday and work every summer. So I always had a job. I had an insurance license when I was a sophomore in college, and I was the number one insurance salesman for the Franklin Life Insurance c- Company, selling the President's Passbook Investment Plan, and I'm still playing baseball, I'm playing football, I'm in a fraternity, and I have my own new car. Where's the work ethic come from? I I think for those who, uh, of us who don't have any money growing up, I had a great family. My father uh, was a preacher. My mother was a preacher. My mother was an educator. My father was an educator. And we weren't poor, but we certainly weren't wealthy. And I just wanted to be able to go and, and, and have my own money because they didn't have enough money to send me to college. They didn't have enough money to buy me an automobile. I would never have asked them to do that. Most of the wealth in this country is first-generation wealth. The inherited wealth, the second, third generation, in most cases, spend the money in frivolous ways and don't get there. But the ones who come up, I wasn't a member of the country club. I didn't live on the right side of town. I didn't know or didn't care, but I didn't have this long plan. I want to do. I just wanted to go and do something productive, and have enough money to buy bubblegum football <laughs> cards so that I can get a picture and play games with the football cards for all the NFL players and college players and so forth. And and I didn't ever want to ask my father for a nickel, and I didn't. And so that kind of I don't know where I got that. It was something I did from day one, and it was a work ethic that helped me in sports, and so I had a work ethic in sports, and I knew that I had to get better in sports every day. I had to go out and practice and learn and train and figure out how to play. Business is no different. You've got to be able to go out, and, and the only way you, you, you learn business is to go do business and get in the streets, and I love when the entrepreneurs say, well, you know... Uh, What's the number one thing? I said it before. The number one thing, you got to have revenue, which means you got to have a sale. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a small business owner. 
I've got to be the chief revenue officer. I'm the one who's got to, to have the courage to knock on doors. But it's not that hard. As you well know, James, people do business with people they trust. Mm -hmm. And they can depend on. And so my mark in business is I want to be a great partner. I want to be a problem solver. I want to make sure that my, my customers are getting great deals and great products and great services at fair or reduced prices. And then I want to be there when something breaks, something doesn't work, and they call up and I want to be the first one on their doorstep to fix it. When we have a, everybody that's ever done business successfully, Sam Walton, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, these are, we all know those names. It's Microsoft, Apple, Sam Walton, Walmart. They had one thing in common. None of them were college graduates. None of them were college graduates. Bill Gates attended Harvard for a day. Michael Dell at Dell Computer attended uh, Texas for one quarter. Uh, and, and Steve Jobs was an adopted guy. His parents saved money up all their life for his college education. He went one quarter and said, I don't want to waste my parents' life savings to put me in. So he dropped out of college because these guys, they, they not only had visions, they worked, they did. They, they, what did Steve Jobs say? I want to change the world. Right. Well, you know, well, that's Steve Jobs. Why can't it be me in our own world, right? Of Athens, Georgia, or Atlanta, Georgia, or wherever you might live. When you have that, and the way you change the world is by having an insane notion of products that work and designs that look good mm -hmm. and customer service that's there at any hour of the day or night and never says, oh, you're wrong. You use the product wrong. You, customer, you're always right. I'm going to be there to give you insane customer service. And that's what Sam Walton did. Good friend of mine. Steve Jobs, I, 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 I didn't know him well, but I sat down with him for three hours one day after Apple had fired him the first time. Hmm. Uh, Bill Gates, I've never met. But I, I, I knew Steve Ballmer, his number two guy, who became the number one guy. And it was the culture of these people when they're in their backyard trying to, trying to come up with something to go. And it's not magic. Because here's the deal that I've, I've learned. In football, I had to get better every day. People said, well, gosh, you know, did you change your game plan from year to year, from ga game to game? I said, I changed my game plan from play to play, from quarter to quarter. Because if I got something working, that defense, they're smart. They got people up, the stand, uh, up in there, they're, they're looking at our, at our offensive formation, what we're doing, and they got an answer for each one of them, so I had to keep changing. If you think you've got the answer, you don't. If you're not curious and hungry to learn anywhere you can, how do I become better at what I do? How can I serve a customer's needs? Well, first of all, you need to ask some questions what they need. Yeah. That's something I've always noticed. You know, whenever I would talk to you, always had questions. Yeah. Anytime we talked, yeah. I'd be calling you for something and you say, hey, James, <laughs> what's going on with so on and so yeah. forth, right? And, then, yeah. I, and I always, I always walk away from a conversation going, "Yeah, your intellectual curiosity was always off, off the scales." When, when these different opportunities, so from the NFL to commentating, and then to that's incredible. Yeah. From that to the software, and then the go small biz. Each one of those were they opportunistic and happened to you, or did you go out and seek those? I uh, all the business I went out and sought those. Okay. And and everything revolved around that. Doing that's incredible. I'm not an actor, uh, but what, what I, why, why I did that, I funded my businesses. Mm. Why I went out and made speeches, I funded my businesses. Uh, doing Monday night football was the most boring thing I've ever done <laughs> because I sit in a, in a, in a booth up right. there, it was, and it was the early days of Monday night football. I'm up there with Howard Cosell, right. who's iconic. Frank Gifford, a great player. And Dandy Don Meredith was iconic comedian. And here we are, three or four people in the booth. The game's going, nice catch. Nice run. Whoa, what a nice tackle. And when the game's over, I, need, I had no emotion. Right. Because I, no, I had nothing invested. And wasn't like playing. And it was boring. I got out after three years. Stopped it. 
doing That's Incredible was pretty boring. I was reading a, a teleprompter. I wasn't creating and doing something. If I was the producer, director, those are the ones that were doing something. But I did those only to fund the businesses. my businesses. Got it. Got it. So now, uh, Go Small Biz. When, when did you launch Go Small Biz? 18, 19 years ago. 19 years ago. And what was the thought? Because, you know, um, I've talked to uh, yeah. several folks about Go Small Biz, which I, I love the company. And I'll, pro- I'll probably never do it justice when I describe what it is. I- I'll tell you how to describe it, and then you'll you'll probably yeah. hit me. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. but what I usually say is it's a company centered around helping entrepreneurs be well, successful, right? Yeah, but first of all, nobody, not many people in America, unless you're a small business person, understand who a small business person is. Right. And, and you, you know, we have 29 million small businesses in America, one to 10 employees, and one to 10 employees. And, and help me with the st- stats of how many are starting every month. And there how many are 550,000 startups every month. Right. And, and there's, a, there's a big failure rate because, you know, these people don't have access to capital. Venture capital doesn't go to the small business entrepreneur. None, none of the consulting companies go to there. The banks won't won't talk to them, uh, and so forth, so forth, so forth. So that entrepreneur uh, is, uh, is out there on their own, and they have no help. I didn't even know when I started Go Small Biz what that was because most of my work was with Fortune 1000 companies. That ain't small business. So anyway, this is where the job growth is. Uh, this is. This is the most diverse group of people because it's, it's not just, not just millennials, it's people over 50, it's, 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 it's African-Americans, it's Hispanic, it's women. It's, it's so diverse and wonderful, and this is the biggest job creator we have with no help. And so I got with my chief financial officer who came out of a big accounting firm, Ernst & Young, and I said, what do we do? He said, let's go help small business people. I didn't know who they were. I couldn't define it. How did it come to you? How did the idea come to you? Well, it came from him. Oh, it came from him. It came from him. Okay. And so then we started learning what the small business person is. And and so I got calls from Sandy Weil, who was the head of Citibank. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to have a meeting with me. And so I said, why? He said, well, because we want to get, we love what you're doing. We love Go Small Business. We love your website. And we want to go get in that marketplace. I said, what do you think? A small business business is. He's over. Oh, he said about twenty five million dollars in annual revenue. I said, Sandy, eighty percent of small businesses are are sole proprietors. Their revenue may be a hundred thousand a year, maybe one hundred twenty five, maybe fifty. But these are not wealthy venture capital funded people. These are people that the banks won't talk to. The, but yet they're our most critical group of people that big businesses don't know who they are. Big banks don't serve them. Venture capitalists don't serve them. So we became almost a lone wolf out there and still kind of are because these people don't have a lot of money to spend. And so the people going in business want to get with people that have got a lot, a lot of money to spend. But now we partner with companies like an ADP. ADP has 550,000 small business customers. They're the largest payroll company in the world. So they want to now, they've recognized there's a group of people there that need a lot of help beyond payroll. So they are bundling a bunch of services up. So services about uh, uh, HR services that, uh, you know, you have access to an HR person because they don't have an HR person in, in-house and you're hiring somebody or firing somebody. You need to talk to somebody about are you doing it right or wrong and what the rules are. All these things they never know. They get themselves in trouble. So we provide them with hands, with the internet, we can do anything. Teach them how to sell. Teach them about customer service. Teach them about the things we just talked about that are going to make their business go. Oh, I want, I want this secret product. Well, there is no secret product. Because if Apple comes out with a new iPad, then Microsoft's going to have a, iPad's a little better, and then Google's going to do something. And so they're all in the same space, and they all end up, if you got something that's working, everybody... Now we got Amazon going out there, changing the world of buying, and they started out selling books. Selling books, and look at them now. Now, the whole world's going to come after Amazon, right? They won't have a, just, they're almost by themselves out there. But that's going to change, because it all changes. You said an interesting thing. We can give to your listeners. 
You said, I'm curious. I ask questions. I'm 78 years old. I've got a little energy here. I, I'm never going to retire. But I am more curious today. It's so much fun. I don't know anything. You don't, as you're listening to us, you don't know anything really. And that's what you got to say. Right. And I want to, I want to, I ask questions. I'm curious, curious, curious about everything. And that's how I know this. I've got to be smarter tomorrow than I was today. And the only way I'm going to get smarter, I've got to read things that, that educate me. I've got to look at things that educate me. And then I've got to talk to people and ask questions. And the third is the most important because people want to help you, really. All you have to do is ask questions. And I ask them by, I've got a technology guy, you just saw Larry in there, right? So I'm a big shareholder in Apple. I have been for the last two and a half years. I love Apple, but I, I don't go through a stockbroker. I go out and I, I, I learn the companies myself. I know their products. I go to Larry every day. Tell me about this. They've just launched this home pad, and now it's going to do that. It's going to do this. It's got better sound, better this, better that. And so I read, and then I ask Larry. Right. And then now I've got people, the technical people all around the country. I, I call them up. What does this mean? And then I learn a little bit more, and I get a little bit smarter, and then I learn how to handle that, that company and that stock a little bit better. I, know, I have a better shot of when to buy and when to sell. Are you going to be perfect? No, we're not going to be perfect. We're all imperfect. And, but the thrill of learning, I learn at a faster clip today at 78 than I did at 20, 25, 30, 40, 50. Because you know when we're coming up, we want everybody to think that we're, we got our, our act together and we're right. smart. I want you to know that I don't know a lot. It's hard to believe you're 78. Yeah, I, that car's I too fast huh? for you to be some. That, that, that car's too fast for you to be <laughs> Well, you know, I don't. And and when all you people listening and James <laughs> James is sitting here in such great shape himself, uh, it it's it's a number at fifty. It's a number at thirty. It's a number at seventy eight. I don't ever give it a thought. I don't give it a thought because my whole role in life is to solve problems and to help people. It, that's it. So now 18 years in with entrepreneurs, what are some of the, you know, when you started, you probably had one idea in mind. This is how I think we'll help entrepreneurs. Along the road, what have been some of the, the biggest learnings? I, I, I didn't know. I, I, didn't know I, I didn't know what an entrepreneur small business was. I was a small business person. But as I told you, I was, I was uh, working with Fortune 1000 companies. I was on the board of directors of Coca-Cola Enterprises when they were spun out of Coca-Cola. I was on the board of directors of Blimpy. I was on, so I, I kind of learned, and I learned I didn't want to be on the board of director. Is that right? Yeah, because okay. they're, they're useless. They have no power. They can't make or break the company. The guys are going to make or break the company, whoever the CEO and the management of that company, and how good and creative and innovative, and how they, they're not going to do it by themselves, but many of them think they can do it by themselves, and they treat their people horribly, scare them, and, and they move on their way. I'll tell you, one of the great role models of, 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 of a CEO is the CEO of the biggest company in the world. His name is Tim Cook. And I have a dialogue with Tim Cook. Uh, Tim Cook was an operations guy under Steve Jobs. Now, how do you follow Steve Jobs? Maybe the most creative genius the world's ever known. Certainly our generation, right? He dies. And here's an operations offer has, has, to, has to follow Steve Jobs. Now, Steve Jobs, when he started Apple, got the first PC up and going. Then the big money, the suits came in. The board of directors came in. The public company. Guess what they did? They kicked him out to bring a guy who was the head of marketing, a Pepsi Cola, but he was a sophisticated business guy, put him in a CEO and just about killed the company. A few years later, they got on their knees and begged Steve Jobs to come back when the company was going to fail. And here we have iPhone and iPads and all the stuff that's come out. And you have this creative genius in Steve Jobs, college dropout, and now he dies. And Tim Cook is there. Let me give you Tim Cook's background. Auburn, Alabama. Now, I'm from Athens, Georgia, and I know the world thinks we're redneck idiots down here, right? And... We we're, we're all bad things. And here's a guy that goes to Auburn University from Auburn, Alabama, in the deep south of Alabama. He is openly and proudly gay. And he is the CEO of this company 
And I'm telling you, what he has done is the greatest job, and the people love him. The customers love him. I'm playing golf in Pebble Beach a year ago. And to play golf at Pebble Beach, uh, you got to make reservoir way in advance, and they also have foursomes out. So my wife and I play, and they always put us with two people. One of the people they put us with was a top-ranked executive at Apple. And so I asked him, and I would not give his name. I said, tell me about the difference between Steve Jobs and Tim Cook. You know what he says? No comparison. I said, give me more. Right. Here I am. This is good, good. I'm asking questions. I'm not trying to argue with somebody. I just want their opinion. And if, you, if you're going to get their opinion, then argue. What if he said to me, well, they don't compare. Oh, you mean Steve Jobs is a lot smarter. Right. I didn't do that. I wanted him to tell me what he's going to tell me. And I, I didn't know what he's going to tell me. So I said, tell me more. Tim Cook is the smartest man I've ever known. Tim Cook cares more about his people, more about the customers than anybody else. He is a joy to work for. Mm. Holy cow. So he says to me, I said, I, I'd like to meet Tim Cook. He says, send him an email. I said, he's not going to answer my email. Yeah, some, no, he will. So I sent him an email. I said, Tim, I'm a Georgia Bulldog. Played your Auburn War Eagles. And then I played a little football. So I, in case he, I didn't, I didn't assume he knew who I was, but he did. He writes me back within eight, 18, 16 hours. I get an email back. Oh, I remember you, Fran. I remember you playing for Georgia. Remember you, and I know you've been in business and done great things in business. And I'd like to meet you someday because I'm reaching out, right? You got, you got to reach out. People need to talk to people. I don't stay in my office all day. I walk around this office and most of my people, all of them are younger than me, but we've got kids in the 20s and 30s that are just contributing like crazy. Right. I don't want to hold them back. So I go sit in their office. How you doing? Everything going okay? What's not going good? What would you like this to do? And all of a sudden they, come, they start talking to me. They're 25, I'm 78. I'm a Hall of Fame football player. I made a little money in business. I got some celebrity, got some stature. I go in there and they come into my office now. They have enough, they'll come into my office without, I don't need an appointment. Come and sit down and tell me what you need. But, and you can, you can feel that in the culture here. Yeah. Uh, I was going to tell you that later when yeah. we got done. Yeah. Um, but I was thinking about that today, uh, observations, because I was, I'm preparing for a, uh, a speech um, later this week around company culture. So I'm, you know, my, my radar is really yeah. up right now because yeah. for, for me right now, personally, one of the best things we can do as leaders is really work on company culture. Yeah. Right. It's everything. Right. Everything. Uh, uh, strategy, execution, everything falls on culture. And you have an amazing culture here. Right. I think more I think about it, we've probably known each other now more like nine, ten years. Probably so. Because when I first got to Allstate. Right. Yeah. And, and you uh, ever since. And um Whenever I come to Atlanta and I get here, from the moment I walk through the doors, there's a level of energy and excitement that exudes in these offices here, right? You don't have to push anything. You don't have to move anything. People want to help. They want to serve. They're interested genuinely. There are a number of initiatives and everybody's, everyone's aligned, right? And you've got different divisions and a lot of different things going on, but nothing feels complicated. People are totally committed and it just exudes. And so whatever you're doing to well, get that culture is. there. And I, I want to share this. Yeah. It's, it's about respect. Yeah. I came up when I played high school and college football and all my, half of my years in pro football, coaches coached by yelling and screaming and intimidating, calling you names degrading you you don't never make it you're you're not hard enough you're not work you don't work enough you're not tough enough you just boom and boom and i just rebelled against that and when i in all my life of business i've never raised my voice at anybody i people come in here i don't hire them my the rest of my people hire them, but i i talk to them and i i tell them here's the one thing that's if you're going to make it here one thing that you've got to be you got to have respect for everybody here. I don't care if they've been here 20 years or 20 days. You've got to respect everybody here. We don't have a hierarchy of this person is more important than this. Everybody in this office is important, and you need to treat everybody in this office with great respect, no matter what their stature is or how long they've been here. Or so. And it starts, it's got to start with the leader right there. 
So it's a culture of love, it's a culture of caring. And if you cannot live in that culture and do that, and you're going to be a yeller, screamer, or you're going to go and, 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 and get behind somebody's back, I got to tell you, in this room that you and I are sitting in right now, we are going to change the world of healthcare. It's a blue ribbon group of people. We're going to launch. It's un- under the social. It's a big, under the association it's a big thing. initiative for you, yes. And we had around this table, and there are probably 10 or 12 seats. We had really big time business guys and lawyers for all different things. And we starting to get some, some of our group talking behind the backs of others. And it was just creating an environment. I sat in this chair, I sit right here. I said, before we start this meeting today, this is what's going on. And if we're not going to be open here and caring with each other and being part of a team of working together and love and, and, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to stay here. So I want to get all this out on the table right now. Well, these people call me like, God, I've never been in a meeting like that in my life. But it's got to be that. I, I told one of the great coaches of football a few years ago, I don't want to give his name out, but he calls me up. He says, you know, gosh, we're, we're, they're a winning team. They were one in four. And he said, my goodness, you know, things are blowing up around here. And I've got this one player that's just, just killing us. And I said, I said, you, you've got to either tell him to change or you got to get him out of there. Because I said to him, if you got, they got 53 people now on a roster of a football team. They dress 40, but they got 53 people. I said, if you've got 53 people on there and you've got one dysfunctional, disruptive person, it will knock the culture of the entire place down. And you know what? Traded the guy for nothing. And he ends up doing really well the rest of that year, really well. And this guy goes to two other teams in the next year and then dropped out of football. You cannot, you've got to have a culture, as you talk, of love and respect and openness and being able to disagree. This is America, right? Why can't I disagree? But we want to put everybody in a box because you're this in the box I've been put in all my life. Even when I'm, I lived in Athens, Georgia. I lived where we had Dairy Queens. They had a black water fountain and a white water fountain. Mm, mm-hmm. we, had a, we had cabs for the white people and the black people. Right. What did I know? I didn't know. And all of a sudden, I get looked at as a racist, this, that, anybody that lived in the South. And I said, no. And, and it's haunted me because you get, because we live in the South, we must be terrible, awful people. And now we've got this culture out there of hate, of anger, of, of, of I, I can't even imagine the thing. I, it just, it's, it's unbelievable. I refuse to be a part of that group. I'm going to be what I've been. I love people. I love my people. I reach out. I love diversity. Here's what I don't like. I don't, I'm most, I, don't like, I don't like people that are mean people. And they're good people from all cultures, all races, sex, and whatever. They're, but they're some bad people. I don't like the bad people. I don't care what their color is. If they're bad, they're bad. I'm here to help people, not to destroy people. And of all people. I don't see a separation of people by class, by race, by gender, by anything. Mm-hmm. Just don't. I, I hope through the anger of, of people bubbling things up, we can come out and see clearer of what the vision that we want of ourselves. F- forget the vision of America or Germany or England. How about ourselves? The vision of ourselves. Who we are, because at the end of the day, James, and I told my grandkids this this weekend, 10 of them, I said, the only people, the person that knows you the best is yourself. The person who's got to figure it out is you. You can ask questions, and you should, but you've got to figure it out for yourself. Absolutely. And if you're going to try to say, oh, I'm, I'm getting a bad deal here. I wish I was born wealthy. You're not. I wish I was born to this race, to this gender, to this thing. Well, you're not. 
You didn't. <laughs> this is who we are. Take it and do something with it, and do it with great love and great care. Absolutely. I remember. I remember when I when I told you about uh, I was starting this podcast and in, in, in a company uh, when I was telling you about it, and uh, I remember you turning to me and saying uh, how much it was needed. Yeah. And the passion in which you spoke about it, uh, you just just made me remember that all over again. When you uh, kind of as we, we begin to wrap up a little bit. Um, you're so passionate and your level of conviction about small business owners and helping them and what they mean to the fabric of the country. As people listen to this and they're thinking about starting that journey, yeah, they're thinking about becoming a small business owner. They're thinking about my niece, as an example, is a, uh, she's a Uber driver. Yeah. Uh, she, uh, does Uber eats. I think that's how she started. Yeah. Then she, uh, she parlayed that and did uh, regular Uber while she still has a job. Yeah. Right? She, she $400 a week, $500 a week while she kept her job. Sure. She's like, I'm doing enough for Uber to cover yeah. my rent while I keep my other money from my other job. And she just keeps building and yeah. building, right? Yeah. And I think it's a, a, a wonderful strategy. As people go to say, okay, now I'm going to start going into something that, you know, is a, mo- a bit more committed, has fixed expenses and yeah. all those other kind of things. What are some of the lookouts? What are some of the, the pieces of advice that you give to small business owners that are now ready to put more of the chips on the table? What, what, what are some of the things that you advise people to think about? Well, I think, number one, you've, you've got to go do something. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the younger that you get started doing something, by doing something, I don't care what the job is. I, I don't care what it is. You know, it, it's like I knocked on the door of shipping clerks in the Dakotas. Uh, I sold I sold life insurance. I ro- worked on a chicken farm. It doesn't matter. It's a matter of working and earning. And all of a sudden, I get a paycheck, and I like that. My paycheck from the farm was forty dollars a week. I like that forty. But if you get forty, you like to have eighty. Right. If you get eighty, you like to have one hundred sixty. And by doing something, it doesn't matter what the job is. High school kids, college kids, go wait table. What an education that is, right? And, and, and if you really do a good job waiting tables and you're really good with the customer, that customer is going to tip you. I don't go, when I go to restaurants of any kind, I don't go by the 20, 30, 40. Uh, I'll go in, and if I get really good service, I give them 100% tip. Is that right? 100%. I want them, the people there, and I don't say anything. They don't know who I am. I want them to see, what did I do to get this 100% tip? Mm. You learn from that, right? And so it's a matter, it's not to what you do, you, that you are doing something. And from that, so many people, well, I want to be wealthy. Well, you can be, but you've got to start doing something and getting paid for doing something and seeing the value of that and seeing how to make that work. And, and so that's the greatness. And we're in America, we can do that. We can do that. And the people that I've known, you know, that have made it, they've got great work ethic. and they love working. I, I'm, sad. I'm in here in the office. I love working. When I'm on vacation, I am in touch I, because I want to be in touch. Because if I'm not, what if someone had a real problem? One of my customers had a real problem, and I'm sitting over in, in Italy. Ah, I'll get back to you when I, no, I got a problem now. Call me. We'll solve that problem right now. 98% of the big time people in business in America, and you know because you've worked in big time, they, they turn off everything when they go on vacation. Just turn everything off. How can you be the right kind of person if you turn everything off? Because stuff happens. And they need me when stuff happens. And they need you when stuff happens. So it doesn't matter where you start out working. It's a matter of do it. And, and then, because all work is, ends up being the same, if you really do your job well, treat your, your, your partners well, treat your customers well, you're going to get a good feeling out of that. People are going to treat you differently, and you're going to get a better vision of what you should be. You cannot do it from just going to Harvard. <laughs> you cannot do it by reading a book. Right. I'll tell you, my son, who runs my insurance company, and he's pure as a driven snow, unbelievably great, goes to Princeton. Wonderful school, academic, wonderful. You know, the Ivy League schools, one thing for certain, nobody fails. <laughs> nobody fails. In my schools, we failed. Right. Now, then he goes to Harvard Business School. Nobody fails. Right. He went to work in, in, in the summertime at Microsoft. Had all this pedigree. Then he goes out and he works. And he goes out and he works. 
And and then he says to me, he says, you know, Dad, I want to come and work with you at your companies. I said, okay, come on in. He didn't know anything. Mm. All this experience of work in big companies, right? All this education. He had no idea. I said, son, I'm going to pay you, but I'm going to fire you. I did. And he went out, and he worked on his own for two years, and I paid him. So he did, but he worked. I didn't care what he wanted to work. He'd be extra. Came back, said, I'm ready. And boy, was he ready. He is really good. And he's a good, and he's a great leader. And he, everything I'm talking about, he practices every day. I asked Sam Walton this question. Sam Walton, for those of you who don't know, was the founder of Walmart. No college education. Started in Bentonville, Arkansas, in a little bitty room, no bigger than the room that, we're, that James and I are sitting in today. I don't know. It's 20 by 20, 30 by 30. But, and he had no money. And he's in, not the technology business, he's in the goods and services business. And so he built it. And if you look at the top 10 richest people in the world, three of them will be Waltons. Biggest company, most employees anywhere in the world. So I asked him one day, I was in his pickup truck with him in Bentonville. He never had a new car. And in his pickup truck, we're going over to this little place to have, have lunch. It wasn't the country club. He wasn't a member of the country club. He didn't play golf. And I said, Mr. Sam, when's it enough? And he always thought before he answered me, we might have driven another mile. I didn't peep. I gave him the question. <laughs> I sat there jerking along in that, in that old pickup truck. And finally he says to me, he says, never enough. What do you mean it's never enough? He said, you know, every morning I wake up with the fear that people won't come into my Walmart stores anymore. Now, this is a, this is a secret for your people. Every morning I wake up with the fear that all of our business is going to go away. I have a, you know, so I wake up with a sense of desperation. I got to be sure I'm there. I got my ears open and I'm looking and I'm seeing and I'm reaching out. And, and, my, and, and questioning, are we doing the right thing? We got the right products, the right services. We're treating people the right way. And, and so I've got that little chip. I learned that from Sam Walton. Every great person I've known has that little chip on their shoulder when they get up. Not a chip of anger, a chip of ah, better. And make sure, because if I got that little chip, then I'm seeing more things. I'm hearing more things. And I can make better decisions. So there we are. Thank you, friend. Uh, Thank you. Last question. Yeah. If we're going to have one more person on this podcast, who do you know you would recommend that be? I'm going to cheat here. Because you're going to have Will on here, aren't you? At one point, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> because Will runs all of our Go Small Biz stuff here. And uh, he's 37 years old now. And you should have him on because. He is practicing everything that I've said, and he, and you put intelligence with that. It's, it, it's amazing. But if you had one person that, I'll give you a few people. I would give you Bill Belichick, mm. and I would give you Nick Saban. And mm. they're, they're great friends. They're very much alike. I don't know Belichick. I know Saban well. These are the two greatest coaches of all time. One pro, one college. Wow. And they are not driven by the press. The press, they're journalists. So nothing wrong with that. They're writers and journalists. They have no idea how to run a football team or how to run a business or how to run a country. And it's fine for them to write their stuff, but you cannot depend on their stuff. So Be Belichick, what's he do when he has a press conference? Well, we're moving on. Next question. <laughs> well, you know, we, that, was, that was last week's game. We got to <laughs> worry about this week's game. Right. And, we're, we're, and, and they don't seem to have a lot of personality, but they got a great empathy for what they do, and they are learning every day. These are two people that are extraordinary. Now, I'm going to give you a business guy that's still living. He's a precious soul. His name is Bernie Marcus. Okay. Bernie Marcus is now 87, 88 years old. He's got his fastball. Mm. Founder of Home Depot, from the dirt up. He was a uh, immigrant, Jewish refugee, I think from Russia, lived in tenement housing in New Jersey. And from that background, 
He goes and builds Home Depot from nothing. He's enough. I, I just like these people. I, I, I think, call up Tim Cook. Different problem, right? But here he comes from where he came, was mentioned, from Alabama. Number two guy to Steve Jobs. Totally different personality. He's more of an operations guy. And now the innovation coming out of Apple is unbelievable. But the pundits, oh, gosh, after, after Steve Jobs, he'll never be able to get there. They're going to be the first company to get to a trillion dollars. And, Steve, and Tim Cook has been the CEO for five years, six years, seven years. And they're transforming, changing. Steve Jobs said, we want to change the world. Tim Cook is changing the world. Decent, wonderful, not a yellow scream, all the things we've just talked about. But for you people listening, James Russo is everything I described today. That's what he is. When he walks into our office, our people, our people run in here to see him because he is the right kind of guy with the right kind of stuff. And he's a guy that cares about people, unbelievable business background, life background. Uh, and um, we become great friends over the years. Thank you, and, friend. Uh, so I'm glad you're doing these podcasts because it's education for the people. You don't need to go to Harvard or any college to get an education of how to make your life better. You just don't have to. But you need to be open to learning. Don't be a yeller, screamer, hater. If someone's a Democrat, respect that. If someone's a Republican, respect that. Someone liberal, respect that. If someone conservative, respect that. Have discussions. Change views. But don't yell and scream. Don't call names, and we can all be better that way. And I'm going to tell you, I, I just feel, I know everybody is down and out about today and all the yelling and screaming and da-da-da. I'm optimistic about today. We spent a lot of years with our politicians in, 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 in Washington that did nothing but raise money and get reelected again. And, and I think you've got to go through some turmoil to come to find something. But the one thing I know we got to do, we got to make our country better every day. And, uh, and we got to be better people every day and more engage, engaging of all people. Anger never wins. Hate never wins. And I don't practice hate and I don't practice anger. Uh, I practice goodness and helpfulness. As you said, 78... And uh, I, uh, I'm a happy 78, and I cannot wait for the rest of the day to get going and for tomorrow to happen. Yeah. Thank you so much for Thank being here, friend. My pleasure. Thank you for linking up with me for another episode of The Corling Solution. Three important notes before you leave. Number one, please subscribe. If you're listening on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or whatever your service of choice, you will see a subscribe button. Please use it. You will then be notified each time a new episode is available. Number two, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes or again, whatever your service of choice. As a new podcast, this is very important for us. It is truly one of the biggest ways you can support us. Number three, this program is about empowering you through awareness and actionable insights in the areas of personal and leadership development, entrepreneurship, and social justice with a focus on education in particular. As you listen to the show, you will have questions. You will hear some things that are new to you and maybe terminology you've heard for the first time. All of those things are good, and I am here to serve you. Go to our website, thecorlingsolution.com, and right below the show notes for that podcast episode, you can ask your questions right there. You can mention the challenges you face in the areas I mentioned, and you can even tell me about other guests you'd like to hear from. Thank you so much for linking up, and I'll see you next episode.